How can we use physics to make this go faster? Can you use physics to win a marble race? This is the University of the Netherlands. In this lecture, we'll consider the, the physics behind a rolling ball and ask if understanding the science of this can give us an edge when we play childhood games like the marble room. So, first of all, I want to discuss the physics of marbles. And the first concept I want to introduce is the idea of bounciness. Now, as a child, we're all familiar with the bouncy ball, the rubber ball, which bounces a lot. But the idea of bounciness was quantified in a scientific sense by Newton in 1687, who introduced the idea of the coefficient of restitution, which is the square root of the ratio of the height the ball is dropped from to the height the ball bounces to. And as you can see, our bouncy ball pretty much returns to the same height. But if I take a different ball, it bounces to a much lower height, or to the extreme, I can take a ball which does not bounce at all. So this in, in, has a coefficient of restitution of almost one. This has a coefficient of restitution of almost of zero. It doesn't, it is no bounciness. And this is somewhere in between. Now the surprising one, which surprises most people, is actually glass marbles are actually pretty bouncy. Most people expect glass not to bounce because you're used to glass breaking when you drop it. But actually, if you don't break glass, glass is actually surprisingly bouncy. So the second concept I want to introduce is even older than this, which is the idea of friction, which was first introduced but studied by the Greeks. Friction is the force that resists an object which tries to move. So if you push this block, friction tries to stop us. Now, friction acts between any two surfaces which come into contact. This is why when we rub our hands, they get warm, because there's friction between our two hands, and this friction appears as heat, which we feel. Friction was first quantified by Coulomb, who introduced the idea of the coefficient of friction to quantify how much friction there is. And the idea is quite simple, and it's determined by the angle at which an object will start to move under its own motion. So if we put our, this book on this table, it is quite happy there, lying on the table. It is perfectly happy. But as we increase the table, the friction force increases to hold it in place, but eventually the friction force will get to a maximum and it can no longer hold it and the book will slide. And th this, this angle at which the book starts to slide is known as the friction angle. And Coulomb defined the friction coefficient as the height of the table to the length of the table at the point sliding appears. So this is our second concept, the idea of friction, quantified by our friction coefficient. Now our book slides at quite a low angle, but if we take our block, we have to get to a much, much higher angle before it slides. So as you can see, different objects have different coefficients of friction. But I hear you shout, balls don't slide, balls roll. But you are right, uh, balls do roll. And if you look at our marble, we can see what rolling friction is much, much lower. It takes only a tiny little angle before our ball will roll. So you are right, balls do roll, so it is important to also look at rolling friction. And the fact rolling friction is lower than sliding friction is the reason what we use wheels to get around. And one of the lowest rolling resistances is steel on steel, which is why train wheels are made of steel. And as you can see from this table, you can see what the values of rolling friction are orders of magnitude lower than sliding friction. So it's, it's hundreds to thousands of times more efficient to roll than slide. However, this idea has been used many times to reduce friction, and da Vinci, uh, among others, uh, realised what you could actually use the ball bearing, which basically can convert sliding friction to rolling friction to actually reduce the amount of friction between objects. So if I push this board, it is actually quite hard to move it on the table. But if I put my marble between it, the board moves absolutely freely. Because now, it is rather than being given by the sliding friction between the board and the table, everything is being controlled by the rolling friction of the marble. It's not always true what rolling friction wins. So if, if we consider our car driving along a road, if we hit ice and our sliding friction gets low enough, the car will slide. This is the idea of a skid. So sliding friction is still important even if we expect to be in an area where rolling friction dominates. So for our marble, we need to quantify both. And actually, in reality, in our marble course, the marble is neither sliding nor rolling, it's doing a mixture of the two. So we have to quantify the sliding friction of the marble as well. So how do we do that? Well, as I've said, the marble wants to roll. So if we just let the marble in it, it will roll. So the way we do the sliding friction is we glue three marbles together. So now they can't roll because the marble can't roll because it's locked in position to its neighbour. So if on here now I've got four marbles, three of which are attached to each other and the last one's three. As I slowly increase the table, you'll see what, when I hit the rolling angle, off goes the single marble, but the three marbles stay together until I hit their sliding friction angle and they start to slide. 
So now we can see how we can identify both the sliding friction and the rolling friction of our marble. So far, we have learned about the bounciness of our ball, which is quantified by our coefficient of restitution, the ratio of the square root of the heights after, before and after the bounce. And we have learned about sliding and rolling friction, which is quantified by the ratio of the height to the length of the track at the point the thing rolls slash slide. The last two properties I want to introduce are much more familiar with us. This is the idea of weight, and of course our glass marble is much more heavy than our rubber marble. The idea of weight and the idea of size which is simply quantified by the radius of the particle. This is a much larger marble than that. So our marble in our marble run is quantified by four properties. That's bounciness, friction, size, and weight. So the question you'll be asking now is, why am I interested in this? Well, for the last decade, uh, me and colleagues at the University of 20 have been developing an open source code, have been leading an open source code to investigate granular materials. Now, I hear you saying, what are granular materials? Granular materials are, in essence, anything which is made up of discrete, solid objects which interact. So this is everything from sand on the beach, the, sand, the individual sand grains interact to become a granular material, to the sugar you use to make pears with, to Tic Tacs, to coffee, to even to tablets, to creamer you put in your drink, even to things like um, bearings you use in every day. So granular materials are, are anything made up of discrete objects, uh, discrete solid objects which interact. So we've been investigating these, these granular objects for over a decade and developing co codes with many other universities to simulate these things. And then one day, one of my colleagues, Case Fenner, rings me and says, last night I saw on the news this marble rum on the Dutch news. Could your code simulate this? Hmm. This was an interesting question because the code was actually designed to, to, to actually simulate the interaction of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of objects. So could it accurately simulate a single, a single marble going through a complicated course? We thought this was an interesting concept and we thought, let's try it out. So with my colleague who co-founded the code, Thomas Feinhart, he designed an interface such that the code could run marble runs. And then we offered this as a bachelor project. And Sven, a very good bachelor student, came along and designed his own marble run. This is Sven's marble run. And like all good mechanical engineering things, it has both duct tape and WD-40 on it. Because it's the rule of engineering. If something's too flexible and should be rigid, apply duct tape. If something's too rigid and should be flexible, like the C-force, apply WD-40. And this marble run applies the general mechanical engineering rules. Second, let's introduce our marbles. We have 10 marbles in total, which range from our bouncy ball, which we met before, to our traditional glass marble, through wooden marbles, including stainless steel marbles, plastic marbles, and even an incredibly light styrofoam marble, which you can see drift in the air because it even gets affected by the air. So these are our 10 marbles. This is our marble room. So the question is, which marble will be the fastest through? Now, you're probably tempted to go for, say, well, this is quite easy. All I need to do, from what I've already said, is pick a marble with a very low rolling resistance. And when you think about it a bit more, and you probably think, well, hold on a minute, there's probably a secondary effect here. I probably need a fairly bouncy marble, because when it falls down between the levels, if my marble's not very bouncy, it'll probably lose a lot of energy. But hold on a minute, Sven's much more evil than that, and he didn't design a simple course. He actually built into this course traps to actually make it more complicated to predict what's going, what marbles will do. Now, our first trap is right near the top, and our first trap is designed to trap mar marbles which aren't bouncy. So the way the first trap works is the marbles roll into this wall and bounce back. Now, a bouncy marble will bounce back well and take the upper red route, whereas an unbouncy marble will lose all its energy, fall down and take the slower route below, the slower blue route. Now, our second trap is actually quite simple. It consists of a V-shaped cut in the floor. So the marbles roll over this widening V-shaped cut. And as they roll over, if the marble is too small, it will fall through the V-shaped cut, forcing it to take the extra loop around the track, as shown by the blue line. Whereas a very big marble will be able to roll all the way over this V-shaped cut. The third trap is a combo trap. It consists of two holes. So the first hole, the small marbles fall through, and the second hole, the large marbles through, and then they fall into seesaws. So this is designed to filter the marbles based on their density. And density is the ratio of weight to size. So first of all, it filters them on size, and then it drops them on seesaws where they need a critical weight to tip them. And if they don't have that weight, they get completely trapped on the seesaw, and they never finish the course. 
So now we have seen the whole course and we have seen our selection of marbles and you can clearly see their properties in the table. So the question is, which marble would you choose? Which marble would you pick to beat your friends at this game? I'll give you a few seconds to think about this. Okay, so now you have thought about it, chosen your marble. No changing and no cheating. So now let's, let's move to our computer simulation. So let's load the Sven Marble Run into our software. And then we are able to run through our software marbles with exactly the property shown. So as you can see, the software is able to recreate the motion of the marble, bouncing off the walls, going through the traps, and even tipping the seesaws. So it looks like the software works quite well. So the question which remains is, is this actually true? So let's just drop a few marbles through the course. If we time these marbles carefully, uh, here are the results. Now, as you can see, most of the marbles actually are very similar to the computer simulations. And all the marbles take exactly the same route as the computer simulation. The two exceptions being the plastic marble and the bouncy ball, which are both considerably quicker than they were predicted in the computer simulations. Now, there's a good reason for that, something we didn't take into account and something we didn't discuss earlier. Now, our bouncy ball is a bit different to the others because when it interacts with the surface, it actually squashes. And the actual contact with the surface actually goes from a point light to being actually a large surface area. Now, this we didn't take into account, but we could have. And this would have actually corrected the properties of the ball. And a similar thing happens with plastic. When plastic contacts with the surface, it deforms and changes its contact area. And this we didn't include. So, ignoring the plastic and the rubber marble, we were very much able to predict it. And we got the order pretty much right. So when we're looking at the order, the only mistake we made is the plastic marble appeared in position two and should have appeared in position three. But in general, the computer was able to tell us which marble to choose. So in conclusion, I'd like you to think when you're going around the next day, well, look around you today and tomorrow and see. Everywhere you now see how many granular materials there really are around you. And be aware that the world is full of this wonderful state of matter called granular materials, which you haven't really been aware of. And two, if you want to win at games, physics and computers can really help you. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed the lecture.